bringing, uh, you know, everyone's voices to the table and, and the, the pros and cons of this uh, concerns to share. Um, and, and we're all uh, most definitely listening uh, tonight. I think no doubt uh, supportive housing across our, our city in, in general presents um, some opportunity, uh, but no doubt also presents some challenges, uh, particularly in, in local communities of, of what we um, have heard. Um, in particular, just over the last uh, week, I've engaged with many residents, or many of you, and I'm sure you're on the call tonight, um, around uh, some concerns around uh, access to green space, recre recreational activities, uh, the location of the building, uh, some have mentioned uh, access to community services, particularly um, a community garden, uh, community safety, and, and the list goes on and on. We've also heard from many residents about um, accessing this supportive housing and, and how that could, it could play a real helpful role at, at this point uh, in their lives. Um, so no doubt, um, you know, it, uh, there's a wide range of stuff to discuss. Um, and, and I want to thank you again for being a part of the conversation. Um, I want to thank our, 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 our great city staff for hosting tonight. Um, and particularly, um, the speaker following me, uh, Mayor Tory, uh, is with us tonight. Uh, no stranger to our community, um, an incredible uh, friend to our community. We've lost Councillor Ford for just a moment. He was going to give you a, a wonderful introduction there. Oh, oh, you got it back? Okay. I, 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 <laughs> as I said, technology, I don't know what's going on tonight. Um, but I don't know where it dropped off. But uh, I, I just want to thank uh, Mayor Tory for being here tonight. Um, no uh, stranger to our community, a friend of our community. And I'll turn it over to him. Well, oh, you're still on mute, Mayor. Uh, Councillor Ford, Michael, thank you very much. Uh, and it is my pleasure to be here. And uh, I, I was just wondering whether there was something the technological demons were there at the time when he's starting to say nice things about me. But having said that, I'm here to listen uh, tonight and just say these very few words at the beginning. Um, and I want to thank you, first of all, for coming out to these meetings. I've been going to these meetings across the city because the supportive housing solution that we're uh, putting forward and that we're implementing in the city, which is a very important thing for reasons I'll briefly mention, uh, is something that is happening right across the city. And so I've been to uh, many of these uh, public meetings in different neighborhoods across the city. And I'm very happy at the degree to which people have when when they have a chance to have some input on the different things that uh, Michael mentioned, a few of them that are of concern to them. But when they understand what it is we're trying to do, they do uh, the Toronto thing, which is to embrace uh, people who are just in need of a bit more support in their lives in order to get them uh, hopefully back on track. And, you know, in the end, uh, when it comes to helping people who are experiencing homelessness, it's it's good to think about, uh, you know, for a minute. And I've had the experience of, of going around to different places where we will find homeless people being supported and talking to them about their stories. And it's interesting when you ask them, well, how did you end up in effect on the street or in a shelter or uh, otherwise homeless? They will tell you that it started perhaps with losing a job or it started with losing a family sometimes, it started with a problem they might have had with alcohol. Uh, or, or maybe a lot of times people will answer, well, I, the first thing that happened to me was I started to suffer from depression. And it went from there to maybe lose a job after that and lose a family and so forth. These are, you know, moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and brothers and sisters and, and kids, sometimes younger people um, who end up uh, in that kind of circumstance, homeless, experiencing homelessness. And the old way that we dealt with them, which I participated in expanding uh, during my first three or four years as mayor was just to keep adding shelter beds and and you know shelter beds are fine for what they were meant to be which was a place where you'd go for a very short period of time have an emergency to have a bed and a roof over your head but there really were no supports there it was like a dormitory with no supports and what we found of course was that this just wasn't working for people who needed uh, some extra support they needed a home a stable dignified home they needed supports which means people helping with mental health issues people helping to find a job people helping to find more permanent housing and what we found that the success rate was much higher when you provided that support uh, and actually, believe it or not, we, it is it is more cost effective, especially when you take into account all of the appointments at the emergency rooms and different things that end up happening when you're just having a shelter. So th this is this is supportive housing that gives real homes to people. You'll hear more about them tonight 
and it gives them real supports in their lives that is uh, that are designed to get them back on their feet. It is a truly Toronto way we would do this with with a with a mix of of professional help, support, compassion, and understanding, and making sure these people get to be a part of a neighborhood where our experience, pretty much without exception, in fact, without exception, is that once these places have been in in place for a while, they become part of the neighborhood. The neighborhood adopts the people that live uh, in these uh, supportive housing uh, units, and they in turn become very much a part of the neighborhood. And so I welcome all the input we'll hear tonight. I'm here to listen as well, and I'll answer some of the questions if they're appropriately directed to me. But we've got fantastic staff who are helping us to roll this initiative out across the city, and it's going well. It's cost effective. It's it's effective, and it's the right thing and done in the right way by us. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I'll look forward to the discussion tonight. By the way, I should tell you, Councillor Ford is all over me about this. Uh, he seems to call me about five times a day. And uh, he's got lots of input that's coming from you. So uh, rest assured, he is representing your interests in a way that uh, that uh, you'd be very happy with indeed. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you also, Councillor Ford. So we're going to move into our presentation in just a moment. But first, I would like to just quickly cover off um, some of our guidelines for this evening. So we are here tonight to hear from everyone who wants to share their perspective in a very safe and respectful way. These meetings are meant to be safe spaces where people can listen and share. And for that reason, we cannot tolerate discrimination or racism or abusive language of any kind. Um, if it goes down that road, I, I hope it doesn't, but they will result in a warning followed by removal from the event. But I'm, I'm confident that we'll be able to have a good discussion with a lot of uh, conversation around this virtual table um, with lots of input and ideas from the folks on the call. So thank you for that. I'd like to take a look at our agenda for this evening. So we've arrived here at welcome and introductions, and we're going to take a little look at taking how, how we are taking collective action on homelessness through this project. Um, we're going to provide you with some of the details about supportive housing at Tanner's Crescent. We'll talk about the process and the timeline for how this project is planned to move forward. Uh, we'll look at how modular hill housing is built and what you can expect to see on the site should the project go forward. And then uh, we'd also like to talk to you a little bit about um, ideas that you might have for supporting the success of this building. What needs to be considered by the city and its partners as we go forward and that would help this building be successful. And we'd love to hear your ideas about that as well. So um, we will have a short presentation followed some, by some discussion throughout the evening and, and then return to a short presentation followed by some discussion. To participate, I'd encourage you to please raise your hands. You can see the instructions for that here on your screen if you're joining us by phone or by tablet. And if you're on the telephone, you can press star three to raise your hand and press star six to unmute. And I will also be helping with that. Uh, so let us know if you'd like to comment by raising your hand and after you have made your comment, we'd ask that you please try to keep your questions to one or two because we do want to try to get through to as many people as who want to speak this evening. And so um, if we can all agree to keep our comments brief, I think we'll be successful in that regard. All right, so let's get started. I would now like to welcome Abby Bond. She's the executive director of the Housing Secretariat with the City of Toronto, and she's going to talk to you about the need for this housing and the new homes of supports. Abby, over to you. Uh, thank you, Diana, and good evening, everyone. So I've got a few slides um, to walk you through uh, why we're bringing the supportive housing to this community. And I think the first thing to say is that we really, it takes a community, it takes all of us to address homelessness. It's such a serious urban issue that Toronto is facing and also other cities across Canada. And um, in order to really address it effectively, we need everybody to come together. So the city, our health partners, the provincial and federal government, who are both funding partners in this, community groups, neighbours, and also housing providers as well. Only together will we really address this issue. Next slide. So a little bit more information about what's driving um, our focus here. So we see... Um, almost 8,000 people each night experiencing homelessness. And so we urgently need to provide homes for these people with support so that they can transition from shelters or living on the street inside to a safe, warm place. Thank you.
So a little bit about how people find their way into homelessness. And I think uh, Mayor John Tory already touched upon this, is there are many different pathways and reasons why people fall into homelessness. It could be a job loss combined with a health issue or a health issue that results in a job loss, also addiction or any mental health crisis that might occur, uh, disability that might arise, family breakdown, experiences of discrimination or racism. So there are many different ways um, combined with poverty and really a shortage of affordable and supportive housing in our city. All of these things result in people finding themselves living in shelters in our city for far too long or worse living outside in encampments or tents. So the many ways in, but really the best way out is to provide uh, supportive housing. No, that's okay. You can continue. Thanks. So in our housing TO plan, we have a robust 10 year plan that provides a number that lays out a number of actions that the city will take to address this this issue and the fact that really the average person in Toronto is experiencing challenges finding and keeping affordable housing. So we recognize that it's important to provide dignity for people and also support people's well-being, which is why we have a target for 18,000 supportive homes over the next 10 years, of which this is part. Next slide, please. So here we are uh, talking to you about 75 Tanridge Crescent. So the City of Toronto is proposing a five story modular supportive housing building at this location um, to provide homes with supports for around 113 people, um, enabling us to support their health and well being. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so, in providing this warm, safe and permanent affordable homes, uh, we'll be looking to um, focus this housing for people who really, who really need it and often who are more disadvantaged or discriminated against in relation to finding housing. So, we'll be looking to find homes for women, for Indigenous residents, for Black and racialized people, seniors, people with disabilities and other people who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness. I think it's important to say that each of these um, modular homes will be studio apartments. This is like a rental building that you might find elsewhere in your community. Each home will have its own bathroom and kitchen. But in addition to support residents' health and well-being, there will also be other amenities on site, including a shared laundry, a commercial kitchen so that we can run a food program, uh, a dining area, a communal space, a uh, communal area, and also programming space as well. So a little bit about what supportive housing is. So it's really, um, like I said, this is a rental housing building, much like other rental housing buildings you will find across the city and in your community. The biggest difference is that in, ad in addition to the homes, we also provide staffing on site. So supportive homes uh, with those support services, and they can be a range of things, mental health care, um, other wellness supports. It could be a food program, helping people reconnect to family and friends if they've lost touch, helping people gain access to income to address poverty issues, help with laundry and daily living, um, as well as trying to help people transition back into the community. Many people are looking for a way to give back and they want to get back into education or back into jobs or back into volunteering. So all of the support services this will be delivered by staff on site and they really will be tailoring people's supports to what the individual wants and what's going to really help them uh, improve their lives. Next slide, please. So how this supportive housing works, so we'll be looking for a non-profit housing operator um, who has experience and a track record in managing buildings like this. So they have professional building management experience and will therefore keep the building maintained to a high standard. But they also have experience providing those customized supports that I was talking about just before. Um, and also important to say that residents will be given a choice to live here. They will be choosing to move in. They will be paying rent like other renters and getting access to the support. So it's the operator, the nonprofit operator that really takes care of the residents, the building and the property and makes the project a success. Next slide. So as I said, important 
part of success is having a professional experienced nonprofit housing operator. And so there will be, we'll be looking for a number of criteria that will give us an indication about whether people will be successful. So we'll be looking for someone who will be effective in working with Councillor Ford and with your community members as well. Uh, somebody who has experience in managing supportive housing, managing affordable housing, and also has a really robust track record in tenant engagement and communications, as well as that experience Experience providing support services on, on site similar to the services I described earlier. Great, right. thank you so much, Abby. Um, so now I'd like to invite Carrie Bumbakis, the Director of Strategic Innovative Policy and Analysis in City Planning, to share some information about the planning, review, and approval process for the site. So please go ahead, Carrie. Thank you, Diane, and good evening, everybody. Um, a key premise that I want to just share with everyone is that the site that's been chosen for modular housing conforms with the official plan, which I think is very important for people to be aware of. So the um, site is designated for apartment uses and the, for the proposal does conform with the official plan. So what we're looking at at this point in time is zoning bylaw relief. And because of the expedited approval process so that we can bring housing to people quickly, we're looking at recommending that a minister zoning order be adopted by the minister. So the minister would still do what city council would do. It would still put in provisions with respect to height, setbacks, number of units, but instead of council enacting a zoning bylaw, the minister would be enacting what is called a minister zoning order. The recommendation that we're putting forward because of the desire to expedite the approval process will be considered by planning and housing committee on Thursday of this week. And everybody on this call is more than welcome to join in the meeting and provide any of your input to it. It will then go to council. If council supports the staff direction, which is recommending that a uh, minister zoning order be advanced, we will come back to council in July with our final recommendations. At this point in time, it's a little early for us to be putting in front of council and yourselves what relief we're specifically seeking because we're waiting for the site plan to be submitted. Uh, next, please. In terms of the timeline, you'll see that we're at May 18th. Tonight is our first community meeting. Committee will consider the matter um, in terms of whether or not to support the staff recommendation to advance a minister zoning order on Thursday. Council then will um, either support or not support the recommendation. And we'll go on to a second community meeting that is scheduled for later in June, following which we would report back to Council in July on what we've heard from all of you this evening and at the June 29th meeting. We'll also put forward recommendations with respect to what relief to the zoning bylaw would be sought. In addition to all of this, uh, there is a separate process, but it's a related process that will go on, and that's called the site plan approval process. And through the site plan, we talk about the building design, where the garbage would be located, parking, the relocation of the uh, basketball court and the relocation of the playground. All those matters will be considered when we consider the site plan. And we're looking forward to having your input into this. At this point in time, we don't have a formal site plan application. Uh, and this is a positive um, step because it allows you to be able to provide your commentary early on in the process before anything is finalized. Thank you, Diana. Great, thank you so much, Carrie. Okay, so we're now going to turn it over to the community. And if you have some questions about what you just heard, we'd love to hear those from you. Just please raise your hand and I'll keep a speaking order. Thank you. Um, our first uh, person that would like to speak is Wendy. So Wendy, please go ahead. Hi, Wendy, can you hear us? I can hear you just fine. I can't tell you, I can't, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay. I can't tell you how upset I am over this. I am a, I'm a board member of the condominium across the road from where you're planning on putting this building. I've lived here for 37 years. 
I've dealt with this community through all of, I've lived in this community through all of the problems with when we had homeless people down here and they would break into our garages. We've dealt with homeless people and we've dealt with people who have been in need of support and whether that be medical or drugs or addiction, other addiction problems, we've dealt with that. And for, and now we have to deal with this. You are putting a building in front of us. We will have to look at it every single time Every every single time we walk out to the street, we will have to look at this building. It you are taking away all of our trees that not only have provided us the economy with eco ecological advantages, but have also provided a barrier in that people who at one point apart who would stand on the balconies and observe the apart, uh, observe the townhouses across the road, and then determine when they could break into our homes is being removed. So I'm not saying that the residents in the new building would do that, but we have dealt with it in the past. Okay. Now, the other thing that really upsets me is for tw over 25 years, we have asked for a permit to allow us to establish six visitor parking spots because okay. during the day on Tandridge, there is no visitor parking. There's no street parking on Tandridge Crescent. So that if someone has a VON visiting or a workman or a friend that comes for a cup of coffee in the morning, if there is already a car, no, if there, it, they are unable to find a parking, a legal parking spot on the street or, and now you're, and so, but we yep. can't install those parking lot, those parking spaces in our complex. And you know why? Because there's not enough green space and we have 92 units. You are proposing to put 113 units in a space that already accommodates 200 units and plus, and you're telling me there's enough green space across the road from me? I don't think so. Okay. So you're asking us to allow you to do something you won't let us do, which is expand, is to take away from the green space. And I don't believe that you talk about the playground and the basketball court. They are used all day, every day. You are not giving us any guarantee that you will ever replace those. And I and they are used often. Okay. And I can't tell you how often they're used, but every time I walk out to the street, there's that thing. Now, this is an isolated area. We do, it is 15 minute walk to get to the bus. Mm -hmm. Even though we have a bus that comes in, if it's not going the way you want to go, you have to walk out to the bus that will take you the way you go. Mm -hmm. And the other thing in this area is the buses are getting fewer and fewer. And it's not just, it's not because of COVID. Mm -hmm. We have fewer 96 buses because they now have the 996. But in order to do that, it's a 20 to half hour walk to access a 996. So, What's the sense of having it go past a corner that's sure. 15 minute walk where you have to walk another 15 minutes to access it? This okay. all has to go to you increasing the population in here by 113 people because all the services that are mentioned on your thing cannot be accessed without a hike. And I know I don't drive a car, I'm prepared to ride my bicycle to my doctor's office over on Kipling. The bank's over on Kipling. And yeah. you want to set them up with a bank account. I don't know how, because okay. there's banks on Islington, there's banks at Crossroad at Western Road. Those are the closest banks. They're still a half hour walk. Yeah. So okay. a lot of these services, and these services which aren't available to us, 
who live in this area without a hike are going to be available to a group of uh, to a to to a city group of people but i can't access them i can't access the daycare i couldn't but when my children needed mental health care mm -hmm. we went down to cabbage town okay. because that was where I could access the psychiatrist. So you're asking 113 people to move into an area where there are none of these services are being, that you're saying you're going to provide. None of them exist right now in this area. Even to get to a drugstore, it's the top of the hill, 20 minute hike. Okay, Wendy, so I'm saying a few things here. Yeah, and so we're hearing there, a few things. And people I, wanna... Did you, did you no, there's the, one uh, more thing I want to say. There's one more sure. thing. You're sure. proposing to put this on the north side of Tandridge Circle. It's very busy now. On the south side of Tandridge, there is a huge open space. It is not used. People don't travel that way unless they're in a car. They don't because it's not convenient to go, but it's empty. It's dark. It's scary to walk there at night. If you were to put a population on the south side of Tandridge, mm -hmm. which on property you still own and still control, that spot, the putting it on the south side would mean that there would be traffic, that it would be less scary. And in addition to that, there's a street called Beatty, which the petition, which the residents of Beatty petitioned once upon a time to have that street closed off because they were afraid of the Ontario housing being put in behind them. If that street was opened up, we would have greater, we have, would have, there would be more access to Tandridge and a hundred extra people would not create, would, would have, those hundred people coming in would have easier access to where the buses are, to traveling to places. And it wouldn't be as, and we would have one more exit to Tandridge Crescent. Because right now there's only two. You either come in off Bing or you come off, off Arcot. That's it. If you opened up that street, which still exists, the opening to that street still down there, mm -hmm. you could have, you could increase that. But nobody's talked about that. And had you asked anyone in here, we could have told you because the people who live in YCC 191, there's a lot of them that have lived here over since the property was built in 1964. Right. Okay. And we understand these things because we've lived here. Okay. And we know so what it's like. And we've built and and the and we've had to build bridges between our our neighbors in YCC 191 and we've managed to do that over the years right okay so when let's, uh, let's you take don't a pause ask there, us. Can. I, I think let's let's give the city a, a moment just to respond to a couple of the things that we're hearing we've talked about a little bit about the um the location of the building on the site and whether that's something that can be considered um we've talked about the parking spots um and you've mentioned perhaps opening that street well, I, I, I only use the parking example as the green space. We're not okay. able to put them in because there's a city bylaw that says we can't. I see. Okay. All right. So how is it? I want to make sure that if you're putting a five-story building for 113 people and it doesn't, it doesn't abide by the same rules that we have to at YCC 191, I want to know why and okay. how. I mean, just because it's going to go for a minister's order? Sure. Okay. Did, Carrie, did you want to speak to that? Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for your comments and, and your comments are very important. These are what we need to hear from the community because as I said, we don't have a formal site plan application yet. So hearing your comments enables us to attempt to address a number of your concerns. In terms of the playground and the basketball court, one of the reasons at the outset I spoke about the official plan is one of the requirements of the official plan is when we ever have any intensification or infill development on a site, we do require that the existing amenity space either be maintained, in this case it's not, um, replaced, which we are proposing to do, 
or improved upon. So your comments are very valid and we're, we're happy to hear them. And these are things that we will be looking at through the site plan, but I can assure you in terms of both the playground and the basketball court, they will be relocated on the site. But, but you're not, but right now where they're located is someplace that's accessible to the entire community. You put them on the other on the south side of Tandridge or in behind them or some or in behind the you you I so can't going... trust any hold on I can't trust anything you're going to tell us because the last time you had a community the city of Toronto had a community meeting in here it was about a soccer field that was going to be placed over the Humber River behind 901,000, the group of 1,900, and it looked like it would be in a lovely place and people would be able to access it, even though there is no parking down there. And they, because they could access it from the parking lot at Summer Hill, Summer Lee Park. Well, when not, and that was all we were told. Well, when the park was built, it was so disrespectful for where they put it because it's six feet two meters away from the apart from the actual homes and they're supposed to, and not only was it not a soccer field it was a football field and the football never got mentioned but and the place where you put it can't be accessed there's no parking so how are people they're supposed to park at summer lee and walk around the park to get it or, but the fact that it was within five feet of someone's home and would and whoever lived there and whoever lived beside them would be totally disrupted every time there's a football game was really disrespectful. So I really, and not only that, but because they were putting this, this soccer field down behind, they were moved the playground that was there. And that wasn't the, what never mentioned in the meeting either. Both were going to be accommodated. So I'm told there is no playground down there, Terry. And I can't trust anything you say. So where the fact is right now, that basketball court is in a great position because it's close to the apartment, close to the co-op. But moreover, if you've got kids that go over to play there, whether they be from the 900s or the thousands or whatever, mom just walks up the, the, the fence, walks up the street and calls the kid in. And the same thing goes for the playground. It's a convenient place for a lot of places. You put it on the south side or move it or put it in behind the 900s, nobody will be able to know where their kids are and it won't okay. be safe. So the kids won't use it anymore, not like they do now. Okay, thank you, Wendy. I think we're gonna have to move on here. We have heard your concerns and we've listed. We've thank listed you very those. much. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks everybody. We're going to move on to our next caller and that's Heather. Heather, please go ahead. Oh, Heather, are Hello? you with us? Can you hear me? Yes, please okay. go ahead. Okay. So I, I support much of what Wendy said. Um, I think, uh, sorry, I'm just bringing up my notes here. Um, I, I think it's unfortunate that we're being consulted on the location of the basketball court, but not being consulted on the location of the home. Um, we've seen the people out doing geophysical work or, or not geophysical, sorry, geotechnical work for the last three months. Um, I thought maybe there was some contamination there. It turns out you were looking to put a building on there. If you'd asked us, you might you would have heard that we a lot or a number of us would prefer that it go on the south side of Tandridge um, on the golf course property. And it seems that since you are planning to get a minister's zoning order, there would be no reason why it couldn't go there. There's plenty of space. Uh, the servicing is all there. If you block that area off while you're doing the construction, people can go around the other way and not be impacted. There's a bunch of scruffy trees there, but there's lots of green space around, so all the wildlife could easily move there. Um, and the soil conditions and groundwater conditions, uh, 
and that's something I know about because I'm a groundwater scientist, um, could easily be are very likely the same as at the other location. So you could easily redo um, your building quite easily. So my first question is to Mayor Tory, and that is, will the city consider relocating the building to the southern section of Tandridge Crescent using a piece of the golf course property? Thanks, Heather. Well, we're here to uh, collect all the ideas tonight. I will tell you that when through the uh, process of a site selection, uh, they uh, we are very careful about looking at all the different options. This is not just options on Tandridge, but across the city and trying to find the places where this can bet best fit, uh, best be accessible to the people who will be living there, best to be, um, you know, part of the community and be less disruptive to, uh, you know, all different aspects of the community. So. There's nothing that will be suggested here tonight that uh, we can't take away and, and take a look at, but uh, they, they do go through very careful a process of consideration as to all the different factors that go into where you site uh, one of these buildings. But uh, I'm sure that Abby will or others will want to pick up on this because they can tell you more about, about the process that was followed. But uh, everything we're taking note of here tonight, we're going to report back to you on uh, later on. Abby, do you want to comment on that or Sorry. somebody thank else? Thank you very much, Mayor after? Tory, and thank you for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, Abby, can you tell me if, if that property was considered? Um, so, yeah, we looked at the entire site. Um, no, this to is see the golf course south of the road, not the north side of the road. I think that we'll have to take away and have another look at. We looked at the site um, on Tanridge to see the best location, and that's what we're, this is the location we decided to propose, um, but we can take your suggestion away and do some more work to see if that is in any way feasible. Okay, my other question um, pertains to the basketball court, and I think that Wendy was alluding to it, but that basketball court uh, is in a very central location. We all walk by it. We see the kids, they see us. So there's a lot of security, uh, you know, we're all, all the neighbors as we walk our dogs and other things are keeping an eye on them. And the fact that all these adults are walking around all the time means that the kids are on better behavior than they might be elsewhere. And as a result, if you move that basketball court to the backside, um, as Wendy pointed out, that's not going to be the case. So if you are in fact putting the building where you have it, proposed, which I sincerely hope you will not. Um, could you consider um, negotiating with the city or the public school board to put it, move it over onto the uh, school property or to, to annex a piece of the school property to put it so it's in a similarly central location where the kids are secure? Okay, thanks. Um, I think um, we've heard, we certainly recognize the importance of the basketball court and the play area to residents and the community. And we intend to relocate both of those based yeah, on but our the relocation is the problem. But what I, what I wanted to say was that as part of that, we want to do um, separate consultation with all of the users of those facilities um, and get more ideas and more feedback about the relocation. So we'll be doing um, increased engagement around both of that, both of those pieces um, over the coming months, uh, making sure that we get uh, full feedback, especially from all of the users of that site, of those sites. I was going to say, I'm not sure the kids have the exact same perspective that we adults have in terms of their security, but uh... Okay, so, so I hope that you will take that into consideration. Thanks, Heather. Okay, we're going to move on to our next uh, uh, participant, and that is Lessa. I believe it's Lessa. Lessa, please go ahead. Hello, uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Tory and um, Councillor and Trustee Ford. My name is Lisa Williams George, and I happen to be the principal of the lovely, beautiful little school in that community called Braeburn Junior School. It's a K to five school and um, I'm deeply concerned and I'm advocating for my community, my students, I'm giving their voice here for this plan. I actually feel that um, to choose between people that are homeless to have somewhere to live with supports and to choose the safety of a community and children is a, is a terrible predicament to be in. And so I'm resonating with the residents that have spoken before. So I was happy to hear that this has not yet passed through the ministry, that it's not a full go ahead. 
and I'm hoping that a full and wholesome consultation will be uh, happening. My concern is the basketball court that the students use. Um, my, also, my other concern is that it's in a community that is already um, struggling. It's a high-risk community. We're number 17 on the Opportunities Index. We have a child care center. We have Brayburn Community Place. We have many other community supports there. So I'm wondering if this is the most prudent and wise space to put this. I'm also going to echo what the, the Wendy said about access in terms of resources, taking the bus, grocery store shopping. What are these adults going to do in the middle of the day? I'm concerned about my little children. And certainly annexing a part of the schoolyard to relocate the basketball court is, is a questionable uh, thought. We also have a community garden that sits right beside the basketball court. So you have the school, the community garden, the basketball court, and this is for our residents who themselves need support, need resources. There are no resources in the community other than that. We have a food bank at uh, in the apartment building. So to add more people to an already distressed neighborhood is something I'm asking that you consider very seriously. I'm wondering if there were not other possibility in all of Rex Rexdale trustee for you know Rexdale Dale very well. You know the needs of our community. I've dealt with you in the past, so you know very intimately what the needs of this community is. And so to take away space for the older children that go to the high schools uh, to play on and to take away the community garden from the residents in the buildings and the housing projects that are already located there, I'm not sure it's going to benefit the community, although it's benefiting people that need somewhere to live, give them a place to, place to live. I'm wondering if 75 Tandridge is the best possible place for this, considering the struggles that I already have with my community, my parents, the, the, the children, and everything else I'm trying to do um, for our, our wonderful, wonderful little community. I'm going to ask you to consider that and to deeply consult us further. I'm glad this is a first meeting, but we need to be asked and we need to have a voice in terms of what this community looks like. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Councilor mm -hmm. Thank, thank you very much. And, and, I, and I really appreciate the principal Brayburn coming out uh, today and, and she does great work. Her concerns and, and, and particularly Wendy's and Heather's as well are heard loud and clear and believe me i fully understand the concern with the school being right next door um and and there are no doubt that if this moves forward um it, there are challenges with that that we need to be committed to working to address and i think that is first and foremost um when this came up uh, immediately um, working with our city staff, as it came to my attention, I identified the school um, within a millisecond, and, and Abby and I have had conversations about that. Um, to your further point, have, have we looked at other sites? Um, immediately, I started to present uh, other options uh, with our city staff, and I think they're continuing to look at other things. Um, but. It, um, you know, I think the challenge is to be very, to be very blunt and honest is, is the timeline and, and, and staff have shared that with me. Um, so, look, I, I get it. I understand. I, I, I agree with that. Um, and, you know, if this does move forward on this site, um, you know, I'm not going to rest until we make sure that, you know, the school is taken care of in, in the surrounding community. But I think tonight is an important uh, consultation to have with the community to hear these concerns, right? Um, you know, I know the community well, I'm, I'm in there all the time. Um, so I shared what I knew when I saw some challenges immediately. Um, but look, uh, hearing your perspective is, is very important. And as well, um, just to make one more point, um, when this was coming forward, I made sure to reach out to both the superintendent uh, and trustee uh, Gill uh, in the area um, to to put this on their radar, and they have committed to being a part of this process as well, whether it is here in a different form or whatnot. 
um, they're a part of the process. Can I just say one more thing? Um, I would like um, like to ask Mayor Tory and um, Trustee Ford to not go ahead with this project on this particular space. I really am asking you that on behalf of the community and you both know um, the work we're doing with our racialized communities and our uh, desperate communities. My school have had not had not one COVID case and it's not because they don't care, it's not because they're poor, it's not because they don't listen, it's because we have formed community and we wanna keep this going. We wanna move this community forward. So I would rather have support for the efforts we're doing during the pandemic and moving forward to raise our LOI index to make sure my literacy rates when those children leave are high and make sure that Sisseltown Collegiate and, and um, the Elms Middle School that these students feed into are well supported and that their needs are met. This does not meet the needs of this community, though it needs, meets the need of another group that needs our help. I'm wondering if this should not be located somewhere else in order to let this little community continue to thrive. Um, my other point is I've been in another school where I've had to talk to the city about another proposal and every morning I would need to get to the school at seven to pick up broken bottles. They set fires, um, uh, prophylactics are on the ground. These are young children, needles are on the ground. I'm not saying that this is what's gonna happen should you relocate homeless people there, but unless you're gonna do a very stringent um, screening of who comes and who's ready to be in the community with that kind of independence, um, you're going to have to really reassure us that the students are safe, the families are safe, the homes are safe, and that this struggling community will continue to have an opportunity to improve and strive. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Lisa. We're going to move on to our next uh, caller, and that is going to be Claudette. Please go ahead, Claudette. Claudette, can you hear us? Claudette, are you there? I think we may have lost Claudette, so we'll come back to Claudette and move on to Kathy. All right, Kathy, please go ahead. I don't know if, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Mayor Tory, it's Kathy Birch, and as you know, I advocate for the accessibility aspects of these projects. And this is another project that my committee, the RPAP committee, will be monitoring and will be working with uh, city staff to improve uh, the accessibility as needed. Um, and as we go through these different projects, hopefully the quality of the accessibility and the criteria around accessibility will be improving with each project. We hope that this one will be a little bit better than the last one and that we'll keep moving forward and it'll be more clear as um, to be able to meet needs of people with physical disabilities as these projects go forward. Abby, as you know, I've had a couple of conversations with you, one or two, and uh, we need to do better on these projects for accessibility, um, specifically around wheel trans drop-offs and parking and, and criteria. But I think we can do it, Mayor Tory. I think I think we just need to um, get better information at an earlier stage and and keep trying to do better. Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, Diana, I might just thank Kathy for her constant uh, advocacy on this. And she and I are waiting to take a tour of one of the ones that's already up. Uh, but we're waiting till the stay at home order. So it's getting closer by the day. Thank goodness for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, but um, we're very committed to that too. We want these to be ever better, each one better than the one before, uh, and each one having more units, frankly, that are fully equipped to be fully accessible for people so that we can have the widest possible range of people that can uh, call these places home. So uh, I thank you very much, though, for being such a, um, a, a constant uh, advocate and being at all these different meetings to keep an eye on us and make sure we're doing the right thing. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'd like to go now to our next caller, who is Anisha. Go ahead, please, Anisha. Hi, um, good evening. Thank you, Mayor Tory, for addressing supporting housing issues in Toronto. Um, my name is Anisha Stewart. I'm a resident leader here and a local champion. I just wanted to highlight that we just recently had our basketball court redone 
um, just last year to the tune of over 90,000. So I think that is a waste of funds to pull up something that was just um, money just got put into it. Um, furthermore, we're a family oriented community and bringing in vulnerable individuals with various issues um, that can be anywhere from mental health to drug addiction, sexual perversion issues around an area that has high numbers of children that do not have resources and do not have supports currently is um, a recipe for destruction. Furthermore, we're already an impoverished community. Majority of us are under the poverty line and bringing in more poverty into an impoverished community is gonna bring more violence into our community. Our current conditions in the TCHC housing apartment building and in the houses are dilapidated. We have apartment roofs that are falling apart we have pest control issues that have gone immensely undealt with over many, many, many years. We have mold infestations. We have elevator issues, garage door issues that still cannot seem to be fixed correctly. Point is, there are already many issues that has not been Oh, Anisha, are you there? You seem to have lost you, Anisha. Anisha? Hmm. Okay, sorry about that, Anisha. Um, Councillor Ford? Just briefly, Diana, um, hopefully we can get Anisha back. Um, but if not, I, I clearly understand and, and, and get the point she, she was making on that. Um, and our office has worked with uh, many people in, in the Tanneridge buildings on fixing a number of issues. A lot are personal to them and building related. And I just want to take an opportunity aside from this um, that, uh, you know, I asked her to contact my office and anyone in the Tanneridge community and um, we'll, we'll come out there, uh, COVID or no COVID, uh, to make sure those start to get dealt with and individual concerns are, are, are addressed. Um, okay. That's a side to this, but it's, okay. a, it's an important point to make. Thank you. Great. That's great. Thank you, Councillor Ford, for that clarification. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to go to uh, Venice, perhaps. Venice, is that how you pronounce your name? Yes, yes. Venice. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I echo a lot of what the other members have said. I think the location especially is is like a really bad location. The cell side is something you said you looked into some of it, but some of it you haven't looked into already. Um, and it should be, even if you are going to move the basketball court, there's going to be a point in time where there is no basketball court. It's heavily used that court. You go at 7 a.m., you go at 12 a.m., there's people using it. I know you've all said that you've visited Tan Ridge and you've seen it for a few moments at a time, but you're hearing from people who've lived here for decades and you know it best. So I assume that's why you're listening to us. Obviously, you're going to be doing this. Every community is going to have people who are against the shelter, right? Like it's fair, right? But the thing is, is that as we've all said, this is a lower economical community and it seems as if it's a bit of a um, there's so much better places that they can go and to, pu to put it here when you're already trying to thrive in the, you know, the deck we've been given to give more poverty on top of this all. Um, I don't know how thoroughly that was thought through. I'm happy we're having these meetings. So you can hear from people and I hope that we're listened to. And this isn't just a moment for you to placate us all. Um, because I heard about people saying things were going to be done and it was ignored. I hope this isn't ignored. You heard about the children, you heard about the risks in this neighborhood. I feel like we deal with enough as it is, and it's sort of a slap in the face to add another thing to it. Um, we're glad that you like to visit our communities every now and then. We appreciate it. Michael, you said that you come and you fix a few buildings here and there, but there's thousands of people here and we all suffer in different ways. So it would be great if somehow you can, you know, find a way to help all of us before you add another problem. Um, I, I just think it's not the smart decision to do this. We touched on LOIs, we touched on the poverty, we touched on the children. I don't understand why 
other locations within Tanridge even wasn't looked at, like the south side, let alone outside of Tanridge in a place that's already thriving. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Denise. And um, perhaps I could just ask uh, someone to clarify the, uh, I, I heard you mentioned that it's a shelter and, and just want to be um, clear that this uh, about this site. So, Abby, could you just perhaps summarize um, how this is different from a shelter, perhaps, just so that people are clear? Um, yes, can you hear me okay? I think I'm yeah. having some audio issues, but um, yes, thanks. I just wanted to clarify that um, this this won't be a shelter, that these will be homes, rental homes with their own kitchens and bathrooms. So there will be no kind of shared living, shared kind of personal space. There will be shared amenities, uh, but everyone will have their own apartment. So it won't actually be a shelter. Thanks, thank you very much. All right, we're going to go to our next caller, and that is Ruki. Hi, Ruki, please go ahead. Hello. Um, I just want to start off by saying that, um, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Um, from my understanding, module housing does well in mixed income communities. Um, our communities is under-resourced. Like, I agree with what Wendy said and what my community, fellow community members have already spoken about. We ourselves are unsupported, and I'm a young person, and I don't, I don't drive. This is a very inaccessible location. The buses are awful. Not only are there very few that come into the uh, community, uh, I would have to walk outside of the community to get access to the other buses. Um, and now they've reduced uh, the, uh, the reduced the service that we're getting. I'm thinking about the people that are entering this community. They need a lot of support. I'm sure that they won't be all having cars. How are they going to get around when I, as a young person, have difficulty getting in and into and out of this neighborhood? Uh, the buses are completely unreliable. The grocery store is uphill. The nearest grocery store is uphill. Um, it's going to take at least 30 minutes. I'm thinking of young women with kids. How are they going to take the stroller and go up that hill by themselves? It's expensive to take the bus on top of that. Um, it's six dollars just to go one to one location and come back within an hour uh, or two hours. Um, and I understand the sentiments that other community members also have about the lack of trust that we uh, have with regards to government. As even the software that we have to, uh, here, the playground is removed. They put up um, a soccer field and a football field. However, the grass is only cut once in the summer and the rest of the summer the weeds and the grass are very high you really cannot play soccer there the kids do not utilize it and so we have kids in front in the driveway in the cul-de-sac um scratching up our cars and even my own mother is just like let's just let them do that because they have nowhere else to play so what can we do for them so when we ourselves are so unsupported on resources why are we bringing in people that need the support that we ourselves as a community do not even have? It seems very irresponsible. Uh, and while they might have a roof over their heads, I'm thinking about how are they going to thrive in this community when we ourselves have so many issues with regards to our housing, with regards to the resources that our youth do not have. And we also suffer for so many things like gang violence, um, mold, all of the other things that the community members have shared. So not mm -hmm. even thinking about our own success, about the people that are coming in. It seems like you're setting them up for failure because I, I'm saying this as a young, healthy person who uses a bus, who tries to get in, in and out of this neighborhood. I have a hard time dealing with getting to work, getting to the, there's not a lot in this neighborhood, by the way, everything's very far away for obvious reasons. It's a low income neighborhood. So why are we in, adding on to that and un, like creating a, situation where people are not going to succeed. I don't think this decision has been made through, not even getting to the point of the location of this um, modular housing, which is, as soon as I heard it, I, I could tell you all of the problems with that. Um, we, so um, even with the seniors that are in the 75 apartment, they don't even have a proper place to congregate. Uh, and there are, a lot of them are stuck in that building. And the space that we have in front of the apartment complex is a very small place that a lot of the community members rely on and they utilize, especially our youth, which have basically no support with with regards to other government um, or well-funded resources. So I just want you guys to take that into consideration that we're telling you that this is not good for the community and for the people who are coming in. And I say that as someone who understands the importance of modular housing, we have a horrible um, situation of homelessness and I want 
the best for these people that are coming in, but you are not setting them up for success. And I'm telling you right now that this is a bad decision for the community and for the people who are coming in. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, um, so we've uh, got, gotten to a place in our agenda. We wanna make sure that we're getting through all of the material. So I'm going to turn it back to the presenters for just a moment. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, the, our next presenter to, to go for it. Oh, sorry, sorry, I've got my apologies. I'd like to introduce Kevin Hutchinson from Montgomery System Architects, who's going to tell you tell about, you about modular, modular housing and, housing and the site. And, and we can talk a little bit about this after. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Diane. So I think we've heard a lot of really interesting comments, and I think seeing the site plan will help focus some of those comments as well. And of course, the comments we're hearing are going to be very helpful in adjusting and making changes as we move forward. So what you're seeing here, I've got three slides to talk a little bit about the specifics of the proposal. We don't have the detailed drawings in front of us because we've not made our detailed site plan application just yet. So these are illustrative diagrams at this point. Uh, in orange, in the deep orange with the thick blue outline is the proposed building location at the northwest corner of the TCHC lands on the north stretch of Tandridge Crescent. We are looking at about 113 units uh, over five stories. In terms of the building position, we've been somewhat thoughtful about where we place it uh, so far. So what we've looked at is setting it back from Tandridge Crescent so that we preserve that large swath of landscape trees of those existing mature trees. So the building placement, we imagine kind of in plane with the north end of the existing building. Uh, on the west side, there is an existing driveway, which we imagine shifting over about one to two meters to the west, although there's no plan to relocate or have any impact on the existing community garden plot, so no change is proposed there. To the south side of the building, there is a secured outdoor amenity space or a rear yard space for the residents to use, and that would also have some ancillary structures, which include waste storage and long-term bike parking locations. Much of the debate, of course, has been around the impact to the playground and the basketball court, and I know there's going to be much more consultation and discussion on this, but you can see in the two green zones are the places that we've identified, at least from our side, uh, where we thought those would be appropriate. Of course, much more feedback to come, uh, and the size and location of those, obviously, we look for more comment as well. Uh, perhaps you can go to the next slide. If you are not familiar with modular housing, which I suspect most people are already, uh, but th this this is really prefabricated uh, large pieces of construction that are delivered to site. So the bulk of the construction happens off site in a factory. And of course, one of the benefits of that is the quality. So you're not building out in the, the cool or the, the blaring heat. You're done in good, uh, good condition. So level of quality we usually find is much better in prefabricated settings. We have used this most recently at Macy Avenue and the Dover Court sites of phase one modular housing. So we've we've tested this and we've used it successfully for phase one. One of the other benefits that we enjoy about modular housing is that the construction period is significantly reduced. So compared to a 16 to 24 month construction period, here we can drop that down dramatically to just six or eight months, which means reduced disruption, reduced downtime for some critical community amenities like basketball courts and things like that as well. Uh, perhaps we can go to the next slide, if you don't mind. I think to illustrate the types of suites we are talking about, we put a couple images together that show apartment suites in modular housing. So this is an example of what we would be providing. It's a small studio apartment. Each apartment has its own kitchenette and washroom and a modest sleeping and living area. It comes furnished with a bed, a dresser, tables and chairs. Uh, and then, of course, beyond this, just like any other multi residential building in the city of Toronto, there is shared amenity space or common indoor amenity space. And then, in addition to that, there is, of course, the outdoor amenity space provided for the residents. I think that's all that I have to speak to this to Diana. Great, like to take it back. great, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And, and I'd like and to, I'd to like back, back over to Aki, who's going to share some more information that we've touched a bit on briefly already around the play playground and the basketball court. Um, please go ahead, Abby. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Diana. 
Um, I just want to be clear that uh, we understand how important the playground and basketball court are to the residents and the community, and we are proposing to relocate them, as Kevin indicated, where they're being proposed on the plan. However, in order for us to, um, you know, finalize our thinking on that, uh, we do really need to hear more from neighbors and from people who both use the spaces and live in the air in the area. So we're going to be doing some more substantive consultation, working with TCHC and their staff and to help us um, identify and talk to those people, like I say, who are using the spaces. So that will begin in mid June and we, we look forward to that process and hearing from from people in the community. Thanks, Diana. All right, thank you. So we're going to go back now to our discussion um, because we want to make sure we're having more time and we're going to go back to the, the list of callers here. So I'd like to um, continue with uh, call in user 10. Your your number begins 647574. I have my hand up. Hi, can you hear us? Well, you're right, yeah. No, but I'm about to go. Hello? Oh. Oh. Hi there. Um, we're we're just looking to speak with you. You've called in, and you are your number starts with five seven four. Oh. It's a challenge because we don't know the name of this person, unfortunately. Okay, we'll try and come back to them, and let's go on to the next person here, which would be Shobha. Shobha, please go ahead. Um, uh, hi. Can you hear me? Okay, Diana. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, my name is Shobha Ador. I'm the executive director of Braeburn Neighborhood Place, which is the neighborhood service in 75 Tandridge. And so I, I just heard Abby talking a little while ago about um, how important it is to consult with community groups. And um, so I, I'm just, I just want to make sure that they know that we're there. We serve several thousand people through food security and our licensed uh, child care and uh, before and after school programs. And, uh, we also operate the community garden that's there. And I just, I had a question for Kevin. I wondered if uh, when they were looking at the, at the space, did they note that uh, right by that fence, our toddler playground for a licensed childcare is there? And if, um, if, um, if it was, was taken into consideration. consideration. Yes, so thank you. Yeah, so we have looked at the site pretty extensively. So we are we are looking at that. And I think when you will see a site plan application, you will see some some landscape buffer along that edge. Um, yeah, we are aware of that, but thank you again for highlighting it. All right, thank you very much, Shoba. And we're now going to go on to um go oh to Amal. Amal, please go ahead. Amal, can you hear us? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. okay. Hi, yes. Um, so the I seeing the building in the proposed area. Um, when I first saw like uh the picture of it on the Toronto.ca website, I just thought, like, you know, how is this possible? Like the place is already, you know, being used, you know, children by the community. And putting a building there is just gonna look very packed, very dense especially for those of us living in the building. And, you know, the basketball in the playground, it's a valuable space for many of us in the community. I've lived in Tandridge all my life, and I've seen the development of the basketball court, the playground, and having it just uprooted now, it's, you know, it's just a waste of money, to be honest. And, you know, yeah, I was just surprised to, to hear that a building was just going to be placed there. Like, I actually work with individuals who face homelessness and you know drug addiction and and all those other um things and you know they require a lot of care and you know placing you know i support the housing initiatives for people that face these situations but a building here is is not safe it's it's not um you know safe for anyone to be honest they require a lot of care and i want to know like how you are going to be providing care for them when some of us, we don't even get uh, some of the services that you provide uh, that you are proposing for them. And so I, I want to like, I'm hoping that you guys would like reconsider like placing the uh, the building on the south side, as many uh, of those have said, because this area is, you know, is very valuable. It's it would be very, um, I believe it will bring a lot of other problems, to be honest, 
And so uh, I would like to ask for you guys to reconsider, like, um, not, uh, not placing the building in that area and try to, you know, in a more safer area, to be honest, for everyone. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Jamal. And I think we'll go on to our next caller, and that's uh, Iwa. Iwa, please go ahead. Iwa, can you hear us? Hello, Iwa? Oh, we've lost Iwa. Yes, hello. Okay. Yes, oh, hello. there we go. Go ahead. Yes, thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I just lost my notes, but I'm getting them back. Please go ahead. Okay, so my name is Eva Doroshko, and I'm one of the teachers at Rayburn Junior School. So I'll be very brief uh, since we have already heard uh, the Rayburn principal, Lisa Williams George, address the concerns that we, the Rayburn staff, uh, have regarding this project. Um, I have to say, I agree with pretty much all the previous speakers who expressed their concerns. I just want to add that we educators teach about equity and we want to live by, by what we teach. I believe we would be the first ones to support a project that helps homeless people. You should really hear some of the presentations that our students have in class that address those issues and other related to social justice and equity. Having said that, in case of this project, it seems that we would be taking away from one underprivileged group in order to give another underprivileged group. And I'm thinking about the gardens that Lisa mentioned, but I have not heard about them being relocated. I believe Kevin mentioned something, but I'm not sure what the, the future of these gardens would be. And I can see the community members definitely using them. I'm thinking about the basketball courts and the playground that previous speakers mentioned that are promised to be relocated, but again, not necessarily to a more desirable location. Um, so just to summarize, I am not sure that taking from one underprivileged group in order to give something to another underprivileged group is really the social justice I teach my students. I believe we would be happy always to share with others, but um, this project would seems that it would definitely impact the community in a negative way. That is that is all I wanted to say. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much for sharing your thoughts and feedback there. Did anyone want to address anything mentioned by Iwa or is that got it captured? All right, let's carry on then. Um, in the interest of time here, we're going to go next to uh, Michelle. Michelle, please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, I've lived here, I'm 35. I've lived here since I was two and I have six kids that are now living here. And I understand that it's good to help people that are, you know, are going through some stuff, but this is, we just got our neighborhood to be as good as it is now. We've had to struggle with all of the, the gang violence and all of the drugs and all of that for years. We finally got it to a place where we're okay with our kids going outside. We don't have to worry about them as much as we had to before and we all look out for each other even the basketball court my kid is out there every day at the basketball court my kids are at the park every day at that every single day especially with covid we don't have a lot of things to keep our kids occupied so now we're gonna right before summer take away the two things that we have in the community to keep them occupied and keep them out of trouble and then we, not even just taking it away from the kids, but that basketball court has sentimental values to us. Like we've had memorials there for people that we've lost. We, the construction, every time that you guys have a project that's in the community, it takes longer than it's supposed to. Then it's it's dirty all outside. It's, it's dangerous for everyone to go outside. It just, it, it makes it, it, it disrupts everything around here. You're gonna build up 
a building in a place that I honestly don't think is a good place to be put. And then you're going to put the park right in front of it so that all these people who, yes, I'm sorry that they have issues, are going to be in the building and then you want my kids to play outside in front of them. I, I know they have their issues, but I don't think that they need to come. You need to build the building here where we have our own issues to deal with. I don't want right. to have to worry about the kids outside. And then you're talking about, some people are talking about taking space from the school. Why would you take space from the school when that's for our kids? They need their exercise and stuff. Like you're t it, building the building for them is taking away from us. It's taking away from the, the kids. It's taking away from the garden. There's people in the building that are, they don't have a lot of family. They go out to the garden. That's their way of, you know, probably minimizing their depression. If they have any depression, it keeps them occupied. Um, like, I, I don't understand what the point of putting it in this neighborhood is. We just got it where it's good. Um, could could uh, we perhaps, Michelle, um, could the project partners speak to the garden? Um, I think that's come up a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder. I wonder if I can speak to that. So I think maybe I wasn't totally clear, but there is no planned disruption to the community garden. So the community gardens will stay as they are. No planned disruption as well, and there is no current proposal to engage with the school lands in any way. So I, we we are not planning to take any land from the school at all. Okay, it just seems like it's just, it's it's a really big thing right now. We all have to deal with COVID, staying in our house. And then when we are able to go outside, we're not going to have the things that we usually are able to have access to. It's going to be even worse because there's going to be all this construction and everything. Like it just, it doesn't seem fair. I don't think it's fair. Nobody wants the building there. And if you are... Our, if there's no choice and we don't have a choice and you get the building, then put it over on the side, the other side where there is nothing. Don't take away from us. If you want to add to where there's nothing already, then I don't see the problem as long as there's, say, security around here that can monitor these people because really and truly, we all know each other in this neighborhood. We're all okay. And now you're going to bring in what is it, 113 new people that we have no idea who they are. We got to worry about whether or not, you know, these people are dangerous or whatever. I'm glad that they have the resources that they need in the building, but we still need to be able to be safe and feel safe in our community that we just got to be able to be feel safe in. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Michelle. Your comments? All right, uh, we're getting towards the end here. I'm going to go to a couple more callers and then we're going to close the meeting. So please go ahead, uh, Allison. Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes, thanks, Allison. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm the new superintendent for uh, this area. So I'm happy to be here this evening and what a wonderful way to meet this community that clearly uh, sticks together and works together. So um, I'm happy to be here, Brayburn. Uh, first, thank you for this. Um, for this meeting, I think everyone on the call has echoed that there is a need for the support of those who are vulnerable. Um, so I am supportive of an initiative that helps those who need support. Um, and we know support goes beyond housing. We know that um, many of those who are in need of support, it's because of other social factors that have compounded to land them here. When trustee Gill and myself heard about this, I think it was last Monday, I knew that my role was to support the principal. So I want to thank Lisa for being here um, and a thank you to the teachers and the community. And I've heard uh, pretty clearly many issues that uh, Lisa has outlined. The building is very close to the school. So I'm worried about safety as a superintendent as well. But I've also heard many of the community members, adults articulate a feeling of not being safe that we need to consider. Um, I'm here to support the community. So I would like to for us to really think about what the community has articulated. Um, I think demographics matter. The, the community has articulated that this area is already under resourced. And I heard a question that came out a few times, which was why here and not in a more affluent or area or neighborhood. And I think that's a real question to be considered. Um, thank you to the teacher who spoke. I'm looking forward to meeting you. Um, but she articulated, we live in an inequitable society. 
And if we're serious about equity and we're serious about equitable access, then we really need to carefully listen to these voices. But we also need to ask the question why? Why here if there's already issues that will now be compounded by this particular housing? Um, and again, I want to articulate, I don't think anyone here is not in support of this type of housing. But I think when the community um, isn't feeling trusted, they don't trust because there's other things they've needed and ha and it sounds like haven't received. They're probably also worried that what if the services that these uh, particular people require aren't met? It will pose a safety hazard. So I'm just hoping to continue to support the community, to continue to support the project, and for us to maybe go back to the table and ask ourselves th those bigger questions. Why here? Why now? And were all the other spaces considered? Thank you so okay. much. Thanks very much. Um, Mayor Tori, please go ahead. Uh, well, I just want to say thank you very much for that very thoughtful uh, comment, but I to say a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, and Abby could go chapter and verse on this, but I don't think you're really asking for that. But, but we, we've looked at dozens and dozens and dozens of sites across the city. And uh, to your comment about why are these not located in more well-to-do areas, I think was the expression you used. Um, these uh, projects, uh, which are meant to be kept, you know, reasonably modest in size compared to great big uh, buildings, are located in areas across the city. I've been at all the public meetings. There's one that is being uh, proposed for the beaches. There's one that is built and occupied. I think you saw a picture of it earlier on the screen in Scarborough. Uh, there's one on um, Cummer Avenue in North York. There is another one at a uh, different kind of project, slightly bigger, at Young and Davenport, right in the sort of heart of uh, just around Yorkville there. Um, they're they're being located everywhere. Uh, we So uh, we are putting them across the city because there is an advantage to not having um, huge developments, but rather modest size. And then the second point is simply to say that um, I have uh, had the uh, good fortune to meet and to get to know some of the people that uh, are ultimately chosen through a competition to operate uh, these houses and to provide the support that Abby made reference to earlier. They both operate the building, but they also oversee the provision of supports, all those different kinds of supports. And I will just tell you that um, this is going to be a net positive addition to the community because you're going to have people these people in supporting these residents uh, in a way that I think is going to be quite exceptional. And I think that's going to be um, actually a good thing. I mean, a very good thing. Um, and so I would just say that when you say why here, we're, we're being asked that question in lots of different places across the city. But the bottom line is we're doing uh, this kind of very necessary work in lots of uh, neighborhoods across the city so as to support our more vulnerable residents uh, who otherwise um, end up in places where they don't get the proper supports, whether it's on the street or in shelters, and we're going to give them a home and supports to keep them in that home and to get them on their feet. And I think it's going to be a very good thing. Thank you very much for your interest, and we've listened to everything that's been said tonight. Great. Thank you, Mayor Tori. And we are just at the very end of the meeting now, so I think we'll make that our, our last comment, and I'll just turn it over now back to Councillor Ford. If there are any, any closing remarks that you'd like to share with the group, and then we'll turn it over. Well, um, Diana, uh, our city staff, uh, Mayor Tory, thank you uh, for being here and presenting this. Um, but most importantly, thank you to the community for coming out. Um, look, I, I, I get the frustration. I, I do. I understand uh, the concerns. I agree with many of the concerns. Um, and uh, going away from this meeting, I'm no doubt going to be meeting with our our city staff this week, of course, debriefing uh, with Mayor Tory, um, and, and I've had a number of conversations with him throughout this process, um, and we're going to continue to do that. And, um, you know, immediately, um, you know, when, when we heard about this, we engaged with our city staff, we shared some concerns. Tonight adds to them, we'll go through them, um, and, and really try, and, and if this does move forward in, in the community, uh, to address as many as we can. Um, but look, I, the frustrations and um, I, I've taken note of, uh, of tonight. My staff have been on the call. They've been taking notes. Um, so no doubt we will be engaged with our city staff. Um, this consultation may come to an end tonight. Um, my phone number um, for anyone who wants to reach out to my office um, is 416 397 nine two five five or you can contact my office at counselor underscore m ford at toronto.ca i am happy to continue these conversations um and, and hopefully get to a good a good uh you know position where um the community is happy and if this does move forward 
um, something that we can live with um, and something that we can support people with. And, and I think there, there is an opportunity to do that here, um, but we have to do it the right way. Um, if this does move forward and our staff think this is the appropriate way. Um, so thank you all for coming out. Uh, I appreciate it. And um, um, this isn't the, the last time we connect on this. So thank you. Great, thank you. And Councillor Ford, I just will just reassure folks that this is the start of the conversation um, as well, that, that there will be another meeting held later on in the year. And, and uh, if there are folks who wanna get in touch, we'll put up the contact information for the community liaison as well. So certainly wanting to continue those conversations. So thank you for, for that. And, uh, and we'll now close with uh, final remarks from Mayor Tory. Well, very briefly, Diana, thank you for doing an excellent job as always. Uh, and thank you to all the people who called and were so candid, but very thoughtful uh, tonight. I think people were not, uh, and they, they kept to the rules of the road that uh, Diana suggested at the outset. You know, for um, a uh, challenging job, we all do. Um, and, and, but, but the challenge, one of the challenges in our job is to make sure that at the one and the same time that we keep a successful, stable neighborhood, successful and stable. Uh, but that at the same time that we also have to bring about some change and that includes a change in the direction of looking after some of our most vulnerable citizens. And so we try and do it in a careful way, in a, in a very thoughtful way, uh, in a balanced way, um, in a way that has uh, people receiving the maximum supports they can possibly receive in the context of uh, helping them to fit into a neighborhood and to be supported and embraced and have a dignified life. And that's what we're doing here. We can't afford as a city to make a choice and say, well, either gonna do one thing or the other. We have to do both and the whole city is is uh, taking on this challenge that we're taking on with respect to supportive housing to support some of our fellow Toronto residents. These are our fellow Toronto residents that are having some hard times. And so um, we, we've listened carefully tonight and heard a number of the points that you've made about the neighborhood, the, the facilities and about the way things can fit best into the neighborhood and about um, some of the concerns that you would have about different places that are already there, whether it's the school or the community garden or whatever. Um, so we'll take those back and we're going to do whatever we can. Uh, to make sure that we accomplish the twin goal of making sure on the one hand that we keep uh, a neighborhood that itself has been in need of support and continues to be uh, and, and keep it moving forward, but that we also move forward the lives of these 113 people who will have new homes and will become new neighbors and will be good neighbors. And uh, so I'm, I'm committed to working with Councillor Ford and he is all over me, as I said at the beginning, uh, every day and every night about this to make sure that your views are properly represented. Um, and uh, we will together work with our great city staff to make this a success and something we can all be proud of. And we'll have a meeting a year from today and realize how proud we are to have this uh, this um, new project uh, in this neighborhood and serving our fellow Torontonians and, and uh, producing some uh, wonderful new neighbors. So thank you very much for your attention tonight and for your attendance. And look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Great, thank you, Mayor Tori. Finally, I uh, would just like to put up the contact information, as I had mentioned earlier, this is for the community liaison. So this is a dedicated person who is here to respond to your calls and emails and can connect you to the appropriate um, people to discuss your issues or your um, items that you have uh, that are interests related to the site. And as we had shown earlier in the presentation, there will be additional um, consultation opportunities, both related to this particular building at in, this building in particular, as well as related to the basketball and the playground. So please uh, watch out for some notifications around those and we'll look forward to engaging you at future events. In the meantime, thank you very much again for taking the time to spend with us this evening. We're very grateful for that time and we look forward to connecting again in the future. Have a safe evening.